Good morning, WCC family and everybody. Thanks for joining us for our online service today. Before we get started, just to remind you, next Sunday we will also be online worshiping together as we have been last Sunday and today. And again, if you have not been receiving any of our updates through email, through text messages, uh, I encourage you to give the church a call because maybe we don't have it right. And, and if you'd like to be receiving them, give a call. People are coming in periodically, checking and seeing the message machine. So we can get that and we can put you on those updates. But we'll do everything we can through Facebook uh, and all of our social media to let you know what's happening, if, if things change, if we have to go longer, uh, or when we're going to be bringing things back. But I'm glad you're here today. We're going to be continuing in our series that we've been talking about for weeks about making sure we're thinking about the right things. Because if we're not thinking about the right things, it can give us wrong feelings and wrong actions. So I'm glad you're here today. Take this time and let's take some get ready to worship as we dive in to, to just our God and what he has to say to us today through songs, through the message, through everything we do. Well, let's go before God. Let me open us in our prayer time here. Father, thanks. Thanks for being with us in this different atmosphere that we are, Lord. Just in our homes, wherever we find ourselves right now, may your spirit just speak to our hearts, Father, what we need to hear today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
sing this together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah 
he deserves it. He's so deserving of more than we can give, but he just asks for what we can give to him, and that's all he asks of us. I know the scripture says we're not to forsake a meeting together, 
in these circumstances are we're not doing it online, doing it remote. We are still in one heart, one mind, under one spirit, under the blood of Jesus Christ, worshiping together in this way with the technology. And it's interesting because I'm going to read scripture from my phone, and most people think of scripture as being paper, the big Bible, but you can use your laptop, you can use your desktop, your iPad, your phone. And there's so many ways to find the scripture and study the scripture, and so I'm going to use my phone this morning to read from 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 10, 11. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You see, when we give to God, whether it's our time, our effort, our skills, and our money, as we encourage right now to do online through the mail, it's not just you giving thanks to God, not you worshiping God, but it causes others to do that because they feel the result of God's love through what you do, through what you say. And that's why we ask this morning that we be reminded that we give to God so that people in this world can experience his love and know that he is alive, he is well, he has sent his son to this world as a sacrifice out of love. We've experienced it. And the rest of the world, especially at this time, needs to understand it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have come here to worship you in so many different ways. And we are one heart that we love you because you first loved us. Because you expressed it through your son. Because you express it each and every day in our lives. No matter what's happening, you're there for us. You've promised to always be there for us. And we just want to thank you for that. And we want to continue our worship this morning in all the ways that you've asked that you will be blessed by what we do and that we will be blessed by your presence with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, good morning, and I'm glad you're with us online. Let's dive into God's Word. You know, last week I said that if you're going to deal with temptation, you can't resist it. You have to learn to outthink it. You, you've got to think about temptation in a different way, and this applies to everything within our lives. So what I want to do today is I want to take a look at and see maybe the reason we find ourselves becoming so discouraged in our life is because we're thinking 
about discouragement the wrong way or the things that we are thinking on are not correct and it's causing us to become discouraged. Many times I'll talk with people who are discouraged and they say, Dave, I'm, I'm ready to throw in the towel. I'm just at the end of my rope. And I understand when you're in the midst of the pain, they'll say, it's the worst that it's ever been. This world has ever seen. And, and again, I understand when you're in the midst of your pain that it can feel that way in those struggles and discouragement. But as we start talking about this, I want us to all be on the same plane and understand this, that bad has always been there. It's not that it's gotten worse. See, the Bible tells us that God has given everybody this choice that we can make, this free will. And sometimes people will choose to do what's right, to do what's good. They'll, they'll choose to follow God and obey God and, and, and everything that he says. But sometimes cho people will choose to do the exact opposite and they'll be disobedient to God. And the scripture calls that sin. And when people sin, sometimes we don't realize how far out the ripples go and they can hurt people. People can get frustrated and people can get discouraged. So I want us to talk about and see what that looks like because being discouraged can be so debilitating. It can cause us to give up trying, to give up hoping. You know, we can get so discouraged, we, we don't even want to listen to God. I mean, listen to how the Israelites, what happened to them in Exodus 6, 9. Moses told the people what the Lord had said, but they didn't want to listen anymore. They had become so discouraged by the increasing burden of their slavery. So I don't know today as we're gathered here, and, and I don't know what, has a hold of you? What might be entrapping you in slavery that's causing you to be so discouraged? But I hope as we take a look at the life of Paul, because there was a lot that wasn't good in Paul's life, yet he didn't get discouraged. He was able to push through that discouragement. And I want to look at what little secrets he had in his life. And I hope as you hear this, it'll help you understand some things that you can literally start to put in place today to defeat that discouragement maybe you're facing in your life. You see, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives his testimony of all these things that he had been through. I, I'm not going to put it up. I just, want you to, I just want you to sit there and listen to Paul describe what he's been through in his life. He says, I've worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently because of preaching the gospel. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rod. Once I was stoned, nearly stoned to death. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. And I've been constantly on the move. And I've been in danger from rivers, from bandits, from my own countrymen. I've been in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city and the country and at sea, and in danger from false brothers. And if that wasn't enough, he continues on to say, I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and have gone without food. I've been cold. I've been naked, no clothes. Besides everything else, I have faced daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. And when I hear that, I think, and wow, I think I've got problems. But I wanted to read that as we started our time together because I believe if there's somebody who has the right to say they're discouraged or be discouraged, it would be Paul from everything we just heard. But yet, Paul says, I don't get discouraged. So I want to look at what secrets did he have in his life that kept him from that. The first thing he says is this. He never got discouraged because he always focused on God's love. If we want to defeat discouragement, we have to remember how much God loves us. How much God loves me, how much God loves you. Because everything we know about God, everything that we have, everything comes out of the love of God. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1, it says, God in his mercy has given us this ministry and work to do. This is why we do not become discouraged and we never give up. That saying, we do not become discouraged and never give up. We're going to hear that several times by Paul. But he says, I don't become discouraged. I don't give up because I understand. Because of the mercy of God, he gives me, I mean, everything. If we could just take time and, and stop and, and take a big breath and realize that all that we have, our health, our homes, our life, our family, all that we have is because of the mercy of God, because he loves us. And the mercy of God simply means this, that, that God gives me what I need, not what I deserve. See, God knew every mistake I was going to do even before I was born. Yet he still knit me together in my mother's womb and allowed me to come into this world and live in this world. So Paul says, for me to not get discouraged, I just focus on the love of God. And I think sometimes when people first come to Christ, that's an easy thing to do because they experience this love maybe that they had forgotten and didn't realize and it comes in. But sometimes the longer we're Christians, 
the more difficult this can become. Because how many times have you heard a preacher stand up and say, you know, God loves you, God loves you, God, and here I am again before you saying, remember, God loves you. And I think sometimes the older we get, because I notice this more with the elderly, not to pick on the elderly, okay? But with the elderly, I, I think, yeah, okay, they hear it and they hear it in their mind and know it, but they don't allow it to drop to their heart, those 18 inches, and they don't feel that. I remember one ministry I was at, and we were without a senior minister for a while, so I was helping out filling the pulpit. And I'd preach a sermon, and, and there was this elderly lady. She would come up to me, and, and she'd say, Oh, Pastor Dave, God really used that to commit me, convict me. Your sermon, your message to convict me of how bad I am. And, and I tried to encourage her that she wasn't bad, but you know, I was glad that the Holy Spirit spoke to her and showed her some things that she needed better in her life. Next sermon I preach, same exact thing. And again, you know, God, I'm so, or, or Pastor Dave, I'm so glad God used you to convict me of the bad over and over. And about six months into it, same thing every time. I, I was kind of rude one day because as she started, I interrupt her. I said, can I, can I ask you a question? Does God ever say anything nice to you? And she just kind of looked at me. You see, she had heard it so much, she had forgotten. She wasn't focusing on the love of God. And my friends, if all we're hearing is negative, 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 the voice of God being negative, we might want to stop and think it might not be the voice of God. And maybe we're not thinking about the love of God and focusing where we need to be. So that's the first thing. Make sure you're remembering that God loves you. Secondly, Paul says, never fake it. Be yourself. Simply what he is saying there is, you got to be who God made you to be, all right? Because nothing is more discouraging than trying to be someone that you're not. You put on this mask and in, you go out into the world and you try to be someone who you're not supposed to be. And that can be frustrating. That can be fearful. You can get discouraged because now what if people find out? What if people find out this isn't who David really is or this isn't what I'm really like? And so we become fearful. We become anxious. We become discouraged. And so I'll say it again. God did not make you to be somebody else. When we all get to heaven, God's not going to look at you and he's not going to say things like, you know, why weren't you more like your brother? Or, gosh, why weren't you more like your sister? Or why weren't you more like Billy Graham? Or, gosh, why weren't you more like Clint or the big one? Why weren't you more like Gary? I mean, that's like, you know, almost being right at the right hand of Christ. But that's a whole nother, whole nother message there. What I'm trying to say is, you know, God did not make you to be somebody else. And the point is, God will not bless us. We miss so many blessings. He's not going to bless this fakeness. If we want to receive the blessings of God within our life, we need to be who God created us to be. And we've got to stop living to try to please other people. When we become the people that God created us to be, when we start living that way, that's when God sits up there and says, that's my boy, that's my girl, all right? In 2 Corinthians 4, 2, Paul says, we don't try to trick anyone. That's the antidote to discouragement. We be who God made us. Paul says, look it, I'm not trying to be anybody else. This is who I am, what you see right here. You know, God, we learned this three weeks ago. God didn't even try to please. We realize God can't please everybody. So we need to make sure that we be who God created us to be. And we focus on God's unconditional love and we don't fake it. But thirdly, if we want to defeat discouragement, Paul says, remember, it's not about me. We talked about this three or four other times, but I think it's important that we remember this because the more self-focused I am in life, the more prone to discouragement I'm going to be because every time I forget, every time I forget that life is bigger than me, that I'm not the center of the world, that, that God, I'm not God's gift to the world that's here. Anytime I forget that it's not about me, I'm going to find myself either becoming prideful or fearful or even bitter. Because God did not make the world to revolve around me. Not only that, but when you're thinking everything's all about you, that's when you start to take things personally. And that's, that's when you can get your feelings hurt so fast. So Paul starts to say in the first part of 2 Corinthians 4, 5, our message is not about ourselves. And I want to stop there. He says, it's not about ourselves. And there's two important things. He said, we have a message. God has created us. Okay, and we have this message. Some people call it our life message, but he has a message that he wants us to go out and deliver to the world, that he wants to speak through us to the world. And the message is not about how great I am or who I am. The message is about who he is. 
in the world. And if all of this sounds familiar to you, well, it might be for those of you that have been here a while. When we went through our campaign on Purpose Driven Life, when we read through the book by Rick Warren, Purpose Driven Life, and we did the sermon series on it, the very first part of that book, it says those words, it's not about me. And I know when you make that statement, that is such a countercultural message that to give in this world today, because everything in the world is the exact opposite. Everything in the world says it is all about you, but God says, no, it's not. See, I'm not saying don't take care of yourself. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that it's not about, well, guess, oh, let me go on here, see if I can explain that. In the second part of that verse, Paul says, it is about Jesus Christ as the Lord. We are merely your servants for Jesus' sake. See, I have a message, and the message isn't about me. I'm here for the, for the sake of Christ. My message is about Jesus. And, and, and what he's talking about here is our motivation. This past week, I was listening to a podcast with a gentleman named Ed Statzer, and he talked about how motivation and discouragement, they go together. He said this, God is always more interested in why you're doing what you're doing than he is what or even how, because he cares about the motivations of your heart. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason, he said. Why always determines how long in your life. If you go out on a project or you get a goal, you get an ambition, and you forget why why you'll get discouraged and quit. A lot of people, he say, they start off in life, they'll start off in life knowing what they want to do for a career. They understand what they want to do for a career. And then as they get out there, they forget why they wanted to do it. And so how long they do it ends in their life. So he says, we have to know that. And the fourth thing you and I have to learn is we need to learn to relax. I need to learn to relax in my limitations. Now, what does that mean? And why is that so important in discouragement? All right. Because my friends, you get discouraged when you try to be Superman or Superwoman. You get discouraged when you try to do more in your life that's humanly possible. The facts are, we cannot solve everybody's problems. Can we agree on that? One of the toughest things in my position and, and my job is, you know, I get these letters, I get these cards from missionaries, from different organizations, parachurch organizations, and they're asking for help. They're asking financially for help for us to be there to support what they're doing for the kingdom of God. And the work they're doing is so wonderful. And I want to send them money. I want the church to come together and every Sunday take up an offering to send out to these people to help and to bless the great work that they're doing. But it's impossible for me by myself to do it. It's impossible just for our church to do that. We can't solve all the problems that are there. Do you agree with that? You can't do everything you want to do. You can't spend money you don't have. I mean, you can try. That'll get you in debt. And that can lead to discouragement, correct? You see, any time you don't live within the limitations of your life that are normal, we're going to get discouraged. You can just cram too much in. Read any time management book and they'll say something along this line. It's easier to fill your schedule than it is to fulfill your schedule. It is easier to fill up your calendar with things to do than actually do the things you filled up your calendar with. Does that make sense? And I think we'd all agree that. But we'd all agree that a lot of the times it's easier to make a promise than keep a promise. Like I just said, it's a lot easier to get into debt than it is to get out of debt. That's because we're not relaxing in our limitations. And Paul talks about our limitations and especially our physical limitations. In verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 4, he says, We are like clay jars in which this treasure, the treasure of God, is stored. And the real power comes from God, not from us. He says, he compares our bodies to, to pottery. You know, and when you look at pottery, you see all different shapes, all different sizes, all different adornment, which is wonderful when it comes to those things. But the same thing with pottery, the same thing with us, pottery, if you're not careful, it can get chipped, it can get cracked. Ultimately, it can get broken if it's dropped. And one of the things that can bring discouragement if we don't understand our limitations is when, when we get chipped, when we get broken, and we try to do it all on our own. We try to fix it our way because we forget that we need to turn to God because he is the master potter and can fix it. And it's actually in our weaknesses that he loves to work. It's in our weaknesses that he will come to us with these cracks, what we would call weaknesses, that he will take those and he will fix it and he can use it and turn out to be more powerful. He can work through us in more powerful ways than we could ever imagine. I mean, Think about this. God invaded the earth as a baby of peasants in the barn. 
The kingdom of God entered this world through weakness, not through strength. God has always done that. He's always used weak people who trust him so his strength can flow through him, my friends. This is what humility is all about. You've heard me say this before. Humility is not denying your strengths. It's just being honest about your weaknesses. And we've got a bundle of both. Humility is just being honest about your weaknesses. And it's actually not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. I kind of heard it illustrated this way. If, if you were to walk into a party and you walk in this party and there's people all over the place and you start to walk in and you start thinking, oh, I wonder what all these people, I, I wonder what they're thinking of my hair. I wonder if they like my shirt. I wonder if they like what I'm wearing. I wonder if they notice I've lost weight. And you're thinking all about you the whole time. That's ego. That can be pride. But if you walk into that same party with those same people that are everywhere and you start thinking, man, I wonder who here is hurting. I wonder what I could do to help them. Oh, they're such and such. I remember they were going through this struggle. I need to talk with them to see if maybe I can pray, see if there's anything I can do to help. That, my friends, is humility. So Paul says, just be real, be honest, accept your limitations. And then the next thing he tells us to do, which is very difficult, he says, we have to learn to use our pain to help others. To use our pain to help others. Remember the shipwrecks and everything that Paul went through? Well, in 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 8, he now says, We often suffer, but we're never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. There it is again. We never give up. We never get discouraged. Why? Why is it when it seems like Paul's getting knocked down, he can get right back up? Why is it when he goes through the shipwrecks, when he goes through the whippings, when he goes through being hungry and all those things, why is it he's not discouraged? He tells us in verse 15, all of those sufferings of ours are for your benefit. He's saying, I keep on going. I don't get discouraged because I know it's helping other people. My friends, study after study after study has shown that human beings can handle an enormous amount of pain if they can see a good purpose in it and understand that there can be a purpose, a good purpose that can come out of this. If they don't, then it can become very unbearable for them. And Paul says, here's my purpose. My purpose of my suffering is for other people's benefits. And so sometimes your suffering will be for the benefit of other people. And here's something I want us also to understand. At that moment, we are more like Christ than any other time. Because that's exactly what Christ did, remember? He suffered on the cross, not for his benefit. He didn't deserve that. He suffered on the cross for our benefit. So yes, sometimes God will let you go through pain, not for your benefit. And maybe we'll grow out of that, but he'll let us go through for the benefit of other people. And Paul says, I don't get discouraged because I know it helps other people. I talked about The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren a little bit earlier. And many of you may know that uh, a few years ago, Rick and Kay Warren, their older son, uh, in his late 20s, Matthew, had taken his life. And they wrote, it was one of the worst day in our lives, greatest pain to lose a child to mental illness. It was excruciatingly painful. It still is painful today. They decided not to waste their hurt. They said this, so they help other people who struggle with suicide. They decided to help other families who are struggling with mental illness in their family. The pain you're going through in your life, I don't know what it is, but the pain that you're going through in your life, I'm sorry. I remember at one time in my life, I was going through a, a lot of pain. I was sitting down talking with a friend and he said, Dave, I'm sorry for your pain, but I want you to understand something. This is earth. It's not heaven. This is a broken earth. There is suffering and pain. Yes, there's evil here. It's not good. And yes, we should fight it. We should avoid it. We should push it back where we can. But suffering is going to happen on earth. So he said, Dave, don't waste it. Don't waste it. Use it for good. Use your pain to help others. And I don't know what pain you're going through right now, what suffering you're having right now. But let me ask you, can it be used to help others? Because my friends, many times our greatest ministry will come out of our deepest, deepest hurt. And the sixth secret of defeating discouragement, Paul says, and this is important when you need to take time for renewal. Over the long haul, you need to take time and figure out how to recharge, how to refresh, how to renew yourself. Because if you don't do those things, you will get discouraged. You will get frustrated. You'll get out in that. Paul says in verse 16, this is why we never give up. There it is again. This is why we never give up. All right. 
Though our bodies are dying, literally in the Greek, that phrase means wasting away. Though our bodies are dying or wasting away, our spirits are being renewed every day. You have to learn to renew your mind. Yes, our physical bodies, Paul says they're decaying. And, and we not might, well, yeah, we might not be as sexy as we were 10 years ago. And maybe you think you are, but no matter what, we're going to have to face sometimes. Some of us, we're going to face the bifocals, the baldness, the bulges, the wrinkles, the aches, the pains, the Dunlap disease, or our belly Dunlap over our belt. We cannot stop the aging process but you can stay fresh inside. He says, I renew myself. And you've heard me preach on this if you've been around at all a million times. Yeah, maybe two million times, all right? When it comes to this, how do we do that? The reading of the Bible. Taking, like we talked about last week, memorizing it, placing it on our hearts so we don't sin against him. Meeting with a group of people to study God's word. Praying with God. That's how we refresh. That's how we renew. And lastly, Paul says, we need to stay focused on eternity. If we want to defeat discouragement, we don't just stay focused on the here and now because there is so much more to than the here and now. We have to look beyond that. He says in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, our present troubles are quite small. He's talking about himself. And I want to pause before I go and think about that. This is the guy I said at the beginning that read that whole testimony in 2 Corinthians 11 with the shipwreck three times. He had been beaten. He was without food. He was naked. All this different stuff. And he said, my present troubles are quite small <laughs> compared to what? I see, it's a matter of perspective Paul's trying to help us understand. He's saying it's small compared to the rewards and the joys that we're going to have forever and ever. He's wanting us to understand, yes, we may have a chronic illness, a chronic pain, a chronic disease or whatever that every day we've got to get up and work through and face for however long, 60, 70, 80, 90 years when it comes to our life. But we are going to spend, if we know Christ and have given our life to Christ, we're going to spend trillions upon trillions upon trillions. I think you understand it. Trillions of years in heaven reaping the reward. So he says, yes, our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long. Yet they produce in us an immeasurable glory that will last forever. And he says, here's the key. We don't look at the troubles which we can see right now. Rather, we look forward to what we have not seen. He's talking about heaven. For the troubles that we will see, let me say that again. For the troubles that we see will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. So I don't know if you realize that, but that's exactly how Christ got through the cross. Remember what the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 12? Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up. There it is again. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross. And he's now seated at the right hand, the right hand of God's throne. So how did Christ handle the pain and suffering of the cross? He looked beyond it to the joy that was set before him, to the reward. He had his eyes set on eternity. One of my favorite quotes is from somebody named Corey Ten Boom. If you don't know who Corey Ten Boom is, when you get done with, here with this online, I encourage you to go to Google and look her up. But she says this, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you will have rest. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. You'll be full of discouragement. I mean, boy, how much can we say amen to that as we look around the world right now? Is it so easy to get discouraged? If you look within, what can I do? I'm going to do it on my own. You're just looking to yourself to solve problems. You're going to get depressed because we can't do it on our own. But if we look at Christ, you'll be at rest. Because why? Because he can give us that peace, not as this world gives. It depends on what we've got our eyes on. So my friends, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Or as Paul says, we look forward to what we have not seen. The worship team is going to be up here to close out our online experience worshiping a little bit more. And just before we go there, I want to read one last passage of scripture for you. And, and, and I don't know what you may find yourself discouraged with today. I don't know what you may be struggling with, but I want to encourage you to try to do something because this is usually the time in the service when we are gathered all here in the building that we will partake of the elements, we call it. We'll partake of, of the juice and, and, and a little cracker that represent Christ and what he's done for us. And because he's done that, the hope and the joy that we can have. So maybe you've never done this. Maybe it seems a little uncomfortable, but I want to encourage you where you're at. Find some bread, find a cracker, find some juice, gather with your family, whoever you're with, and take some time to do what we just said. Take some time and to focus on that. 
Focus on the love of God. Focus on what Christ has done for you. Celebrate that. Remember that in these moments and partake of that so we can start thinking about the right ways about what God wants us to be thinking about in our life. We can start focusing more on heaven and the joys that can be there during that time. But I want you to hear these words from Galatians 6, 9. Let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. That is a promise of God to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for that promise we just ended with. Thank you for your truth we heard today. Lord, thank you for what that means to us. Forgive us when we get discouraged, but Father, help us to take these steps of your word. Help us to take the example of Paul's life and to realize we can defeat that discouragement. And Father God, thank you for that blessing of your son, Jesus Christ, and what that means for us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.
go to the Father in prayer. God, we will close today just asking for you to draw us closer to you. Help us to understand that it is a privilege, it is an opportunity to be your child. In the midst of darkness, God, I just ask that you shine bright through us. So draw us near to you. Help us to be better worshipers of you. Help us to be better followers of Jesus in a time where it's so much needed. Thank you for your calling on all of our lives. We worship you now and pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We pray that you are blessed. We pray that you were drawn closer to the Father this morning. Have a great week.